thing I want to do of the hour, or now a little less than an hour we got, I want to do 20 minutes-ish on Homer and the Odyssey with a video file, 10 minutes maybe Aeschylus, who is the tragedian who's before, who you're going to read. You're not going to read very much Aeschylus, but he's the one I like best, and this is my lecture, so I'm doing it. Uh, then a 10 minute goofy interlude, and then 10 minutes of Sophocles. And I will be reading Greek to you from Homer's Odyssey that you've read, and from the and from Aeschylus that I've done. And I'm not actually going to read to you from the third one. I found a really cool YouTube with somebody better than me reading it. Uh, so, uh, so again, the cadences of Greek tragedy is our governing uh, thing for the hour long lecture. Uh, how does Greek tragedy sound? How did it sound in the original, and how should that affect how you read it? So you've all read the Odyssey, and you're almost done talking about it. Um, you've talked about where Homer came from, where these inconceivably old oral poems, these poems that were probably partially remembered by the person doing the singing, and partially recomposed every single time, at least during the most productive part of the Homeric tradition, partially remembered, partially recomposed every single time, how these poems both took the shape they've got how they took on the artistry they've got, and strangely, how they took on this incredible size, 24 books long, and the Iliad, the one you're not reading, is even longer, um, how these poems grew like that. Give a quick look to what I've written here. Um, these are products of a tradition that needed to recompose, but also do it, um, to recompose the story every single time, but do it along the lines that your predecessor had done it your dad or your uncle or your uh, grandfather, whoever you learned how to do the song from, uh, so that every time you're doing it, both at a level of line by line and also at a level of theme or story, you need to have a structured approach to the material, and yet you also need to allow for some flexibility. When I read you some of Homer's Greek in one second, you're going to uh, see how this meter that it's in is structured enough to keep you on your toes. If you guys have done memory work on your own, or wait till next year when you do the senior play for Shakespeare, you're gonna find iambic pentameter, Shakespeare's meter. You're gonna like it when you have a nice structured meter because it's so much easier to memorize your lines. Right, senior teachers? It's easy to eat up those, uh, those metrical lines, whereas the, the non-metrical lines are a little harder. Let me show you a quick video. So the bottom bullet, this has nothing to do with Greek epic per se, but, uh, but I, in all my PBS watching, tripped across, there's this show I love, Saturday Night Globe Trekker, where these young people go around the world. If you know Globe Trekker, it's a good show. And they, they jump into crazy situations, you know, like, oh, well, I'm here on the back of a camel, you know, in no man's going across the desert. I guess I'll see where this takes me or whatever. One of the best travelers, this guy with a very strong British accent, so he might be hard to understand. One of their best travelers, he uh, is in Kyrgyzstan, and he happens upon a traditional singer singing an old epic. And what's really cool, I hope you can hear as the speaker talks about this, uh, the Soviets, when Soviets dominated Kyrgyzstan and owned Kyrgyzstan, they forbade any recitation of this poem. So that shows you how culturally significant, how patriotic these poems can be, and how culturally kind of, how effective, how important they can be. So I want that to put our, our I want us to get in the right mindset. These things are pretty uh, important. In one second. Okay, this might be the slightly quiet video. Yeah. 
So that's pretty cool. <laughs> so again, uh, the purpose of showing you that is, um, is these are culturally very important in some parts of the world. Still, obviously for Greece, uh, uh, almost 3,000 years ago, 2,800, 2,700 years ago, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey were very culturally significant. We even think it had a part of drawing together that little peninsula of Greece and kind of starting to make the people there start to think of themselves as a nation who speak this language, not that language somewhere else. Pretty neat. So I've taken the liberty of doing a passage out of the Odyssey that I kind of like. I don't know what you like, and I don't know what you've talked about in your English classes. Uh, I want to read this twice to you. Uh, this is a passage uh, where, uh, well, it's a passage I like because it happened to be in my dissertation, and it compares very nicely with the next passage you got from Tragedy. Let me set the scene for you. You've read Book 19, where Penelope and Odysseus are right there together. Muy, muy romantico, right? <laughs> Very romantic, special scene. And yet Penelope, of course, depending on your reading, allegedly doesn't really think that she, she the, the poet says she was crying and longing for her husband, who was sitting right there. He's, of course, disguised at this point. Uh, and so if you happen to remember, she tells this crazy story that looks unrelated. She's like, oh, when I go to sleep, I get so lonely. I'm lonely like the nightingale. And then she tells the story of how the nightingale came to be lonely. And the real answer is, if you know this story, and if this came up in class, the nightingale is lonely because the, 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 the woman who got turned into a nightingale, she had got really mad with justifiable reason at her husband. He had done something just grotesquely violent. And so to get back at him, to defend her sister's honor, this lady killed her son, his son, their child together, and realized, like, ah, that got you back, this kid named Pitalos, but then, of course, was overcome by grief. Uh, I've not killed my own son as well as your son, so in taking vengeance on you, I've also really hurt myself and, and, and committed this huge crime, and the gods mercifully turned her into a nightingale. So a very strange story for Penelope to tell. Let me read it to you in... Uh, in the Greek, and then let me read you my English translation. Au tarepe nux el tehele si tequitos hapantas, ke my ni lectro bukinae de moi am pavilon ker, ox se yain a ledon and hodu domene medetusent. Hos tote panda de uku re clo re is aidon. Caldon a e de sin heros ne on his domenoia. En drone en patalois cates domene cucanoisen. He tetama pro posa ke e polo e ke afone. Pai dolo fu romane itu don filon hon tote calco tena di afra di as cu rons de toyo bonatos. What she says there, this is my translation. She says, when night comes and bed takes everybody else, I lie on my couch and thickly clustered sharp cares around my frogged heart provoke me as I mourn. Just as Pandareus' daughter, the nightingale of green woods, sings a beautiful song when spring is newly arriving, seated in the thickly clustered leaves of the tree. And very often she pours her many-toned voice, making lament for her child, dear Itobos, whom once she killed with bronze out of madness, the child of the Lord Thethos. Just so, even for me, is the heart stirred up in two directions, this way and that. I'd ask you to think when I'm going to read it a second time to you, think how strange it is that Penelope, or uh, yes, the Penelope here, Again, it's not an obvious comparison. Oh, I'm so lonely, I'm like this lady who killed her son, right? Very strange, that's not the best way to express how lonely you're feeling. But it probably has huge other possible readings, right? She's talking about 
the strained mother-son bond. Think what her relationship is like with her kid at this point, right? Telemachus has been very rude to her. He's been very much like, mom, go upstairs. You're just a woman, right? Um, she's maybe doing like a veiled threat about female potency to Odysseus. It's a very interesting uh, polyvalent scene. So I hope you enjoyed that when you read it. Let me blow it past you again in the Greek. And again, listen to how the rhythm here, the Latin students might know this as the dactylic hexameter. It's a little different in Greek, but it's close. The rhythm is either dun da da or dun dun. Thank you. 